Hi there, and welcome to my course on differential privacy. My name is Gautam Kamath, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo. So this fall at the University of Waterloo, I'm teaching a course on differential privacy, and I thought, hmm, why not make this widely accessible to people? You know, put these videos up online and uh, make the content available for uh, people so that anyone around the world can learn about differential privacy. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to be teaching uh, this class and providing these video lectures as well as uh, notes and suggested readings so that the goal of this is by the end of this course, you would be able to have the preparation needed to conduct research in differential privacy. So this might be stronger, this might be more than what you really need when it comes to differential privacy, but uh, it should prepare you to do anything else. For example, if you just want to apply differential privacy, if you understand what's in this class, then you'll be able to do that. Um, if you have any questions, like uh, the, the point is that this should be a resource that people can use and learn from. So feel free if you have questions to, uh, you know, maybe post down below in the comments. And if you want to keep up to date on the latest updates with this class, please be sure to subscribe to my channel. Okay, without further ado, let's get straight into lecture number one and the content for lecture one. So for lecture one, what we're going to look at is some attempts at data privacy. Um, I'm, I'm being a bit polite. Uh, and maybe we should, what I should say is some failures at data privacy. It turns out that data privacy is really hard. A lot of people try doing things, try doing ad hoc things, but it turns out to get something that actually works well, you need to be very, very careful. So maybe you don't believe me yet, but by the end of this lecture, you'll believe me as to why this is true and important. So the first uh, example that I'm gonna go over is the New York City Taxi and Limo Commission example from 2014. This like I said, within 2014. And what the NYC Taxi and Limo Commission does is they regulate all taxi rides in New York City. Um, you can't legally drive a taxi without them, without their backing. They regulate uh, medallions and licenses like this. And so they kind of have all the data in terms of taxi and limo trips in New York City. So now in 2014, they were very active on Twitter and kind of teasing the fact that they had all this data. For example, here are the posts that they had from 2014, where you can see here that they're talking about and showing some statistics about when drivers are on the road uh, and when they're not, when they take a break, etc. And so this is kind of interesting because if they're producing these statistics, there must be some underlying data set which, uh, which, which uh, is responsible for, for producing these statistics. Naturally, it would be cool if individuals could get access to these statistics or to this data set producing these statistics, because then they could do all sorts of interesting uh, analytics and perhaps get some insight into how uh, taxi drivers or how people take taxis in New York. So this is a naturally a data set that someone would want. Um, and how do you get it? Well, there's an individual by the name of Chris Wong who uh, managed to figure out how to get it. And this is using something known as a freedom of information uh, request for freedom of information. What's a freedom of information request? Well, there's laws called freedom of information laws uh, all over the world. Many governments say that if there's like specific non-classified information you want, uh, then you can simply just file a formal request, maybe pay some small fee like $10, $20, and then you will get the information you want as long as it's not classified or anything. So New York City has, or rather New York State has something called uh, the Freedom of Information Law or FOIL. So he filed a FOIL request. I'll, I'll comment that this is available also in other, at other granularities. For example, uh, nationwide in the US, there's something called the Freedom of Information Act. And in Canada, we have things called the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act or FIPA, as well as uh, the Municipal FIPA or MFIPA. So, what you can do is you can basically request these types of data sets, and that's exactly what Chris Wong did. He requested, he performed a Freedom of Information Act request for this data set, um, he got it, and he published it online. It's a pretty amusing story as to how he uh, got the information, uh, but uh, that's not the focus of today's lecture. You should uh, take a look at the link of LinkedIn in the lecture notes. Okay, so now what does this, uh, what, what type of data set did he get? Well, he got two data sets, a total of which uh, had 19 gigabytes worth of data. So there were two data sets. One is, uh, what is it called? There is one which has uh, all like fares. 
and one which has all trips. And these total 19 gigabytes of data, like I said. So this should set off alarm bells in your head because this is a lot of data. This contains all the taxi fares and all the taxi trips uh, from 2013 that were done in New York City. So, you know, this seems like a rather sensitive data set. What if you had every single taxi trip that someone took? Maybe then you would be able to identify people. For example, you know, you have a taxi ID and you can see which uh, fares they drove and you know, when they ended and where they ended, perhaps you know, if you see it's in a certain place, then maybe they ended their shift uh, towards their home, near their home. So the point is this is sensitive data and it might contain sensitive information such as you know, home locations or perhaps how much money people make. For example, if you can see uh, one taxi driver and all the fares that they received, then you'd have an, a good estimate of their income for the year, which is another type of privacy leak that we would want to uh, avoid this disclosure. So you wouldn't want this just to be a clear data set which just has all this information unprotected. And fortunately, uh, there was some sort of protection applied to this. In particular, let's take a look at what a row in the data set looks like. Um, so a row in the, this is a row in the trips data set. So it might look kind of arcane here, but let's, uh, let's unpack it a little bit. So you can see here that this is, this is what a row looks like. A row basically corresponds to one data point, one entry. So some of these uh, fields are rather clear what they mean. For example, like let's look at the last two. You can see the drop off longitude and drop off latitude. This essentially says where a trip ended. The previous two say where the trip started. We have other things including when the pickup was, when the drop off was, how many people that were there, how long was the trip in seconds, how long was the trip in, uh, in terms of uh, distance, and so on. So this basically tells you where they started and where they ended, when they started and when they ended. That tells you about the trip. Now, the key things that would be interesting here are things like the medallion and the hack license. So these essentially tell you who is the individual driving the taxi. It tells you it's some sort of identifier. Now, you might think, okay, so we have a medallion number and a license number. These must be publicly known, so we can just identify it. But you can see that some sort of um, anonymization has been implemented here. In particular, you see this uh, ID here, 6B111958, A39, and so on. This seems to be somehow, you know, encrypted, maybe. It's, uh, it's, it's obfuscated in some way. So it seems like, at least naively, just taking a glance, you can't really tell um, who this is because their medallion and their hack license is somehow obfuscated. This, this seems like it's okay maybe at a glance, but uh, let's, let's dig a bit deeper. So in particular, we'll, we'll sort of follow the lead as one individual uh, named uh, Jason H pointed out. This is an individual on Reddit. He found something rather interesting. Basically, what, what he looked up was he tried to find the most profitable days. What days did uh, someone make the most money and who, who were they? What was their license number? So what he found is just looking, getting, getting rid of some sort of garbage data, which may be wrong. He found there's one person, one specific hack license number, which seemed to be rather prolific. Take a look, uh, they, they made $7,682 on uh, September 30th, but just two days before that, they made $6,000, and four days before that, they made $6,000, and the day after that, they made $5,600, and so on. So this seems to be a very skilled, a very prolific, or a very lucky, uh, generously tipped uh, taxi driver. This seems like, who, who is this person, and, who is, and what, what are they doing? How do they manage to do it so well? Well, we're going to find, follow the lead of uh, an individual named Vijay uh, Pandurangan, who wrote a post on what exactly is going on here. So let me just show you one little uh, experiment here. So let's just show you some one simple thing. So if I type echo dash n zero, you can see here it echoed the string zero. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take echo dash n zero and run this in MD5 sum. And you can see here that the value produced is exactly equal to uh, to the hack license, which had such a prolific, you know, streak. So let, let me, let's take a step back. What does this mean? What, what did I do here? 
So MD5, sum, MD5 in particular is a hashing function, which will take some string as an input and transform it to a rather uh, different looking string in a way that should be hard to invert. Uh, we're not going to get into what that means really, but it's just sort of some sort of way of obfuscating uh, the identifiers. So this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is, this is an odd sign because it says, okay, uh, why, why would it match up here? What, what's going on here? What Pandurangan hypothesized is the following. He hypothesized that what actually was happening here, what these medallion and hack license numbers here were, was they took the actual medallion and hack license value, ran it through the MD5 uh, hash function, and then those were used as the new identifiers. This would kind of explain what's going on here with uh, Jason H's finding, because it would basically indicate that maybe there were some errors or missing data in the data set, so they just put in a hack license number of zero, and this would aggregate the fares from a number of different individuals. So, you know, maybe it's reasonable that 10 different individuals, when you pool all their fares together due to missing uh, hack license numbers, then they together would make $7,600. Um, so yeah, that was his hypothesis. And in fact, he found out that this was basically true in the sense that, uh, you know, what, what, what did he do? He basically iterated over all of the possible hack license numbers and all of the possible medallion numbers. It turns out that in New York City, the hack license numbers and the medallion numbers follow a very specific pattern, uh, in particular a few numbers and a few letters put together, and they're somewhere on the order of roughly maybe 20 million combinations for uh, the, these types of values. Now, 20 million combinations might sound like a lot, you know, uh, how would you possibly consider all of these, but for a computer, it's not a lot. In particular, what Pandurangan did was he enumerated all of these possibilities on a computer, of course, uh, and ran each of them through an MD5 uh, hash function. And with this, then he essentially has a list of all the identifiers here and their true unhashed value or the true medallion and uh, license number. So that's, that seems like uh, bad news, right? Well. It, it's not super bad news yet in the sense that uh, what can you do just by knowing a medallion number and uh, you know what trips they took? Maybe you don't have any identifiers or it doesn't tell you uh, who this person is. But unfortunately, what, what he did what's known as a data linkage attack. And data linkage attacks are very important. Uh, they're very common. In particular, there, there is sort of like a first type of attack you might try to do. So what is a data linkage attack? It's essentially finding another data set, which you can link with this data set to sort of reveal some important information. For example, if you don't know who is behind medallion number uh, 12345, then you just know that there's someone with medallion number 12345 who did all these trips. That's not really that bad in the sense that maybe you, you don't know who this is. It could be anyone. However, uh, what if a linkage attack essentially, in this case, what uh, Pandurangan was able to do is take another data set which maps individual names, like their real life names, to uh, their medallion numbers as well as license numbers. So from there, there's the real privacy violation. The idea is that you, now he's able to match the names and uh, the names to their medallion numbers and their medallion numbers to what trips they took, and uh, how much money they made. So essentially, you can find out uh, the locations and the incomes of pretty much any of the taxi drivers in this example, um, assuming that they were in this public data set already, which I think many, if not all of them, should be. So this is a massive privacy violation. Um, are there ways to get around this issue? One might immediately jump to the idea, yes. So like. What if, what if instead of using the, the issue here that we kind of found was that the fact that uh, MD5 was the mapping that, uh, you know, led to the medallion number being converted to these sort of hash medallion numbers. So what if we just chose like random identifiers? Would this work if we just randomly generate a number and just consistently, uh, and consistently use that same number? Well, 
The answer is no, it's not going to be good enough. And there is, it's not too hard to see why, though this requires a different type of side information. Now, to give you an example of why this happens, suppose you took a trip with a driver on a specific date at a specific time. So for example, you know, uh, you, you know, you get in a car which has license, say, one, two, three, four, five, and you talk to the driver, uh, you chat with them a bit, small talk, and you find out, okay, hey, Bob, his name is Bob. Uh, now what you can do later is afterwards, uh, you can get access to this data set, say, all right, I took a ride with Bob, his license number was whatever, and now I, you know, based on this data set, which all rides uh, Bob uh, provided and you know, how much money he made and uh, where he was at various times. So it seems like this type of side information, just sort of casually chatting with someone and finding out uh, their name slash license number, if you took a ride with them, then you know, th this will let you find out any of their private information that's contained in this data set. And I'll comment that you'll think, okay, so this doesn't affect me. I'm not a taxi driver, you know, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm fine. But this attack still is uh, relevant even for other people who uh, may have used this service. Let's provide an example. Suppose you, uh, your friend is leaving work and, you know, at 5.30 p.m., you know that they got into a taxi uh, on a specific date uh, at a specific time at a specific location. So what you can do is, even ignoring things like, uh, you know, the medallion and hack license number, what you can do is take a look at the data set, take a look at their pickup date time, take a look at their pickup latitude and longitude, which you know, you know, sort of where they were picked up and when, and you can see the drop-off location, the latitude and longitude, as well as the drop-off date time, and this might potentially give you access to their home address. Uh, furthermore, uh, I didn't describe it here, but I mentioned there's also a fares data set, so you can also re look up that same trip there, and then you'd be able to find out how much they tipped. Are they a generous tipper or not? Maybe find out uh, private information like that. So yeah, this is just a first example, and it shows you that uh, you know, data privacy is kind of a hard task. You can't just do a best effort anonymization approach. Um, this, this could fail catastrophically, as we saw in this example. Good. So this is just the first example. We're going to go through a total of five examples in uh, today's lecture. And the next one we're going to focus on is what's known as the Netflix prize competition. So Netflix, I'm sure many of you know, is an online video content streaming service. Uh, at one point, they used to actually mail you uh, videos at some point, uh, mail you DVDs. But OK, the point is that they're an internet streaming company, and they're a very highly data-driven and highly statistics-focused uh, organization. In particular, many of their hit TV shows are conceived based on user data, and their recommendation system in particular is tuned in order to optimize you know, user engagement and uh, consumption. So really what this is focused on is their recommendation engine. The Netflix prize was a challenge that was sort of between 2006 and 2009, and the goal was trying to harness the skills and talents of researchers in machine learning and statistics to try to produce better recommendations uh, for, their, um, for their service. And they essentially said, uh, okay, we're going to give you some data, and based on this data, you have to create a model which will allow us to improve our recommendation engine. So what, what does the recommendation engine look like? Well, okay, the idea is you would have some sort of information about each user in the sense like, you know, what they would have is a movie, they, they watched movie one and they gave it nine out of 10. Maybe they watched say movie two and they gave this a two out of 10. You basically have the information about the sort of movies they watched and so on. and the idea is you kind of put it into this, uh, this uh, algorithm here. So this is the recommendation engine. Goes. And out of it pops a recommendation like, you would like, I don't know, movie five.
And you would have, and you know, as a human, you might have some insight into how to do this. Say if they like movie one, which is an action movie, and uh, movie two is a romantic comedy, you'll see maybe they like action movies more. And so you could recommend it. But can we do this sort of algorithmically is the question. Like I said, uh, Netflix had this challenge from, say, 2006 to 2009, uh, and it actually had quite a hefty grand prize of uh, $1 million. And this was the, the winner of this was a team called Belcor's Pragmatic Chaos, which uh, managed to win this using uh, matrix factorization techniques. Now, how exactly did they pose this challenge? Well, they posed it in the sense that what they did to give to, they, what they gave to researchers or people who were participating in these challenges, they gave them a training data set. They gave them a training data set basically consisting of uh, the same type of uh, things that you, would, um, that you would have here. So what, what would the data set look like? It would look something like, uh, you know, it would have user ID, say the movie ID, what movie they watched, the rating of the movie, what score they gave it, and the date. Now, the key thing here is, of course, this user ID has to be anonymized. Um, if not, then you would get exactly the history of whatever user it was uh, who was watching this. So, like, this is, the, you might not think this is so bad. For example, you know, if, if people had your Netflix history, is this really a big deal? Um, well, by law, it is in the United States. In particular, there's the Video Privacy Protection Act of 1988, which, of course, wasn't focused on Netflix. It was focused on movie rentals. But literally, by law, it says that whatever someone's watch history, uh, this is considered sensitive data, and it can't be publicly released in the clear. Uh, there has to be privacy protections taken. Uh, and you might be wondering why. Well, you could think that... One's media consumption is generally considered to be sensitive or private information, which can be uh, sort of dangerous to release publicly. For example, suppose someone was uh, watching a lot of media content associated with a certain minority group, such as a political or sexual minority. Then if this information was leaked, then this could potentially le uh, release secrets about the individual's identity, which they are not comfortable releasing. Therefore, this is the type of reason and justification for laws like this, which attempt to make sure that uh, this is not leaked. Okay, so, you know, it seems like they did a pretty good job, right? Well, of course, as you might be guessing, sort of as the example that I mentioned in the previous uh, example, this, this isn't going to be good enough. And the reason was shown by two researchers, uh, Narayanan, and Shmatikov. And this was an attack shown in 2008. And how do they do this? Well, remember, it's kind of similar to what we talked about in the uh, last section, um, in the sense that, you know, what they did was they took some public information or some side information and used it in order to attack the data set. So what they had, for example, is they had this Netflix data which is sort of private, which is anonymized data, which is anonymized. And they kind of match it up with IMDb data, which is public. So IMDb is in the Internet Movie Database, which is a place where, uh, you know, people have, write, they, it stores information about different movies, uh, as well as allows users to write reviews for these movies. So what did they do? What did Narayanan and Shmatikov do? Well, they essentially matched things up. For example, uh, what you would have here is, OK, you have some anonymized user ID. Uh, but you essentially, what you want to do is match based on the movie rating and date. In the sense that the public data set here will have some sort of uh, many users who participate in the Netflix data as well as the IMDb data set, they would have, uh, have done the same things on the same date. The difference is instead of having some anonymized user ID, this might actually be their name or otherwise some sort of pseudonym, uh, which allows you to identify you know, who they are. And by sort of matching up uh, the other information, 
the movie rating and date by finding similarities, uh, then that allows that can allow one to uh, basically re-identify people's movie watching history. And to give you an example, uh, this is the or to just show you a bit more uh, concretely. So this is uh, say this is a figure due to Arvind Narayanan. And you can see that here's the anonymized Netflix data where, you know, maybe the user, the first user said they liked movie one, they didn't like movie three, they liked movie four. And we have this other data set from say IMDB, which is uh, not anonymous and it's sort of partial data. It's incomplete. It doesn't have anything. It might be kind of noisy, but sort of by taking the best matching between these two data sets to see when things, uh, um, uh, when things were consumed and reviewed by different people and whether their uh, scores aligned, then this putting these two together will allow you to get some sort of noisy estimate of who each person was uh, and what their history is. So it's a bit noisy, but it turns out to be good enough to uh, re-identify many people. And more importantly, it was uh, significant enough to have a real impact in the sense that what happened? Well, uh, Netflix, they, after the first competition, they wanted to run a second competition. They wanted to run a sequel to this challenge. Uh, but the thing is, they canceled it. And in fact, uh, as a result of the, this leak, uh, this information leak and this attack, individuals filed a class action lawsuit against Netflix, which they had to uh, settle. This was settled out of court in the end. So this had major impacts. Uh, this, the, their sort of failure to properly anonymize and privatize the data had big, uh, big impacts on their business in terms of the lawsuit and the cancellation of their uh, next competition. So the point here I'm trying to get at is it's important to do an anonymization and privatization in a principled and a thorough way, or else you might be leaving yourself open to attack like this. And this is especially important in the presence of side information, where there might be some sort of public data set which you can use to uh, help you out. This was the case in both this example as well as the previous example as well with the taxicabs. Good. We'll move on to the next example now.